Hello, everybody. Okay, but my left. Hi, everybody. No, please sit down. Um, that's too much, everybody. Oh, that's so great. I didn't know what to wear today because I was like, first of all, it's raining, which throws everything into a kerfuffle. Uh, it's worse than LA. In LA, they panic, but here we're just like, oh, I need an umbrella. Um, and then I was like, do I wear Western? Should I go full double RL? And then I was like, no, then I'll look like a weirdo that wants to like, be in costume. And then I was like, oh, wait, I have a sparkly chambray. Perfect. There'll be lights. People will be dazzled. Um, so thank you for coming, everybody, for uh, braving the rain, possibly ruining your hair. I don't know how you guys do it, but everyone looks so good. Um, we've got so much to talk about. Such an amazing guest today and an amazing um, family of shows that we're all obsessed with. So without any further ado, please welcome to the stage Emmy Award winning costume designer, Janie Bryant. There we go. Wonderful. They kept saying only use the middle stairs, but there is only one. So I was just like, I was looking for a trap door. That's why I was helping you because I Thank didn't know you. what was going to happen. I know. I was looking for the middle staircase too. Yeah, no, there's, there was one, one way stair. over there, but we would never, <laughs> oh, and that, yeah, we would never do that. Anyway, uh, give it up for Janie one more time. So I'm sure you're all um, fans of Janie and you know a little bit about um, uh, uh, Janie's background. I've known you for a while now. Um, you've done a lot of work in film and television in the area of costume design, which is my personal favorite. Um, but I think a lot of us probably want to know, how did you get started? Um, well, I've been designing clothes since I was a little girl, mm -hmm. um, and uh, my babysitter and my mother and my grandmother taught me how to sew. Great. And um, I went to college for fashion design, and I thought I was going to be a fashion designer, mm -hmm. and I met a lot of film people in New York City because I lived, I moved to New York after I graduated school. Okay. And um, I met a lot of film people here, and I met a costume designer at a Christmas party. Oh, wow. And she really inspired me, and I left, um, I had a design, an assistant design job in the city, and I left that job, and I called every person I knew in the film business and said, I want to be a costume designer, mm -hmm. please hire me. <laughs> wow, so you, you, the dream was always to be a fashion designer and you were working in the biz here. I was. And then you met this person that changed your trajectory. Did, did they hire you to be like an assistant on a project and you got the taste for it and you were like, I want to do this? Um, well, actually I was hired and I really did not like it because um, it was a movie where we had to work nights, mm -hmm. and I just thought, these people are absolutely insane. You think that I am going to, like, do the graveyard shift? I mean, right? Yeah, so no. I thought I was going to leave the film business because it was just too, it was hard, really right. hard. It's hard. So anyway, I, I stuck it out, and I just kept on doing it. But yes, I was an assistant. That, okay. that was an assistant designer, that first movie, but I really was not going to move forward after that first film. What was film. the first movie? Um, it was called I Fell to Mars, and believe me, I felt like that. Huh. <laughs> I, has anyone seen <laughs> it? <laughs> Big I, hit. I'm Big sure hit. it was great training, though. Great training. <laughs> um, they didn't cast me in that. I, that's why I haven't watched it. Um, and then when you started in the industry, were there uh, peers or actually like superstars in the business that you um, were fans of and that you aspired to be like? You know, I actually, I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I mean, I met people along the way. I, I have to say probably, you know, other costume designers that inspired me would be Walter Plunkett, mm -hmm. uh, who designed Gone with the Wind. Oh, wow. And I mean, I didn't know him personally, but like, he I was really, a great I had, guy. <laughs> great guy. Excellent, sir. I, <laughs> yeah, but I really, I didn't really, I didn't have any mentors. Right. But I what didn't. about like, like Edith Head? Were you, um, were you Absolutely. a fan of like classic yes. movies? And then you were like, yes. oh, I want to be like that person. Yes. That was totally my obsession as a little girl. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
my mother could barely get me out of the house. I was stuck to the television watching Guys and Dolls. Oh, wow. And like noticing all their sock colors and also, you know, just seeing the costumes like dance across the screen. Right. I mean, that was always my favorite. Yeah, so, the MGM era of just, you know, over the top, you know, people Adrian. dancing around a giant fountain and on carousel <laughs> horses, it was beyond. Who doesn't do that? I know, we don't get that anymore. Um, uh, but then you became very established and did some, um, you know, shows you might have heard of, like Mad Men um, or Deadwood. <laughs> that name makes me uncomfortable. But um, <laughs> uh, every time I hear it, I can't not think about um, medication. Uh, but let's start with Deadwood. Um, how did that come about? I mean, did, were you lobbying for it or did they just, they call you and say, hey, we're doing this, you know, Western piece? Um, well, I had been in New York, like I said, mm -hmm. and I had just moved out to Los Angeles. I had been working in New York for a few years and I had moved out to Los Angeles and I knew a producer and she called me in to come do uh, The Big Apple, which was created by David Milch. And um, that show ended very quickly. And a year later, David called me and said, hey, I just wrote this Western. Do you, I would love for you to design the costumes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just remember being very uh, calm on the phone, but inside I was screaming with delight and joy because I had been wanting to design a period show. Oh, great. So I, I was connected to him first through um, working with him in New York. And then okay. and we teamed up again for so Deadwood. Networking, if you want to work in costume design, so important. Um, <laughs> and then the period, were you fans of like, was it just a period piece that was exciting to you? Or were you a fan of like, you know, I remember growing up and it's, you know, reruns of Bonanza and Big Valley. And we didn't have that like after the 70s or whatever that just all stopped. So were you a fan of the genre? I wasn't. No. <laughs> no. Okay. I wasn't. But you know, I just, I wanted to design something, period. That right. was, I had just been really wanting that so badly. And a film that really inspired me was McCabe and Mrs. Miller, mm -hmm. um, Warren Beatty and Julie Christie, which mm -hmm. I loved that movie. Um, but really, you know, what inspired me most was, of course, the script, because, you know, David Milch is such an incredible writer and his, mm -hmm. Um, character development is like no other. And where did you start on that project? I mean, do you um, watch other period pieces? Do you go to like a fashion library? Do you, um, how does that research process work? Buy a lot of books mm -hmm. and on the internet. And yes, there is a huge fashion um, and research library at Western Costume in Los Angeles right. that's been around for a hundred years. And so, um, you know, when I was designing Deadwood, um, I did a lot of research there, just okay. because there was less information on the internet, but I researched right. so much at that library. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I was working like at Ralph Lauren at that point, and we would do research too, and it was like, before there was really Google, we had Ask Jeeves, can you imagine? <laughs> yes, exactly. And we had a real library with books, and I was like, oh, this is so heavy. Um, but people don't realize the amount of work that goes into that level of storytelling. Really um, and what I admire so much of your work, and we see it in 1923, which we'll get to, is the level of detail. I mean, you are like a museum curator because it's not just, you know, it's not just their clothes, it's their hat, it's their eyeglasses, um, it's leather goods and rifle cases and buckled shoes. And I just, it's, it's a Herculean task. So, um, and you won an Emmy for Deadwood, did you not? I did. Was I that did. your first Emmy? That was my first Emmy. Wow, that's major. And the only thing that I remember is looking out into the front row and seeing Ian McShane and saying, oh my gosh, I wish I'd had another drink before I got up here. <laughs> it was very intimidating. And did you know when you were, I mean, I don't think anybody really knows, but when you were working on this, did you have an inkling that, wow, this is something really special and we might win some awards for this? I mean, you never really know that, you know? I mean, that's um, never why I, I want to design a show. Mm -hmm. um, I, Deadwood was a very special, special time in my life for sure. But you know, I was a absolute crazy person. I mean, I would stay up nights thinking about like 
how every button had to be perfectly carved. Mm -hmm. And like nobody's gonna see the buttons, but I did not care. I was right. like, that button has to be perfect for that character. That's why uh, uh, Swearingen has that little gold button. Okay. Because it was like a gold nugget that he stole from a prospector. Mm -hmm. Y'all just got a little backstory Details. of like what that, yes. Details. <laughs> that was not in the script. I just made it up in my mind. That's what, that's, that's, <laughs> that's enriching it. And everybody's job, I think, on a project is to bring like more than what's expected. And I think that's what yeah. makes it great and why you got an Emmy. Thank you. Um, and then Mad Men, another iconic, I mean. Thank you. And I think that the role of the costume designer, along with the writer, obviously, and the director, is to help create that character. And, and it's such a visual medium. And sometimes someone can walk on stage or on screen. And as soon as we see them, we kind of, you know, I walk in, you're like, gay. Uh, <laughs> Sparkles. Okay. I was going to say sparkles. Same thing. Um, <laughs> but the power of clothing and the power of that medium is so strong. It, it's, it's instantaneous. So you really helped create um, Don Draper. And, and how, um, you know, what was that like? How, what was your inspiration? How did that process start? And did you collaborate, you know, really intensely with Matthew and John Hamm? Um, yes, well, when I first met Matthew Weiner, I had just uh, finished, well, I guess it was like a year after I'd finished Deadwood. I was still wearing my big Western belt buckle. And um, where I had to go meet Matt was uh, LA Center Studios, which is a very confusing place, and I am directionally challenged anyway. So is that the one that's like on Santa Monica, right in the middle? Downtown. Yeah, mm, yeah. Downtown, yeah. everybody gets lost there. Very confusing. Very confusing. And I get into an elevator, and I see this man there. He's like carrying this box, kind of like a fern hanging over, whatever. And he's wearing this really cute jacket. Mm -hmm. And I say to him, like, I love your sport coat. And he was like, I love your belt buckle. And then he said, are you Janie? I said, yes. And I said, are you Matt? He right. said, yes. So we connected wow. immediately. He was running late. I was lost. And like we connected immediately on the elevator, talked for two hours, and then he hired me the next day. Amazing. Oh, wait. So you didn't, you didn't, you were going for like just a meeting. You didn't know you had the job. Just a meeting. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. we, we all have to kind of like do our little you know, dance before right. we get a job. A little, it's an audition. It's an audition. Uh, <laughs> and also the other moral of the story is be nice to people in elevators. Always. Because you never know who they are. Tell them they're cute. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I usually say that anyway, but I'm just usually trying to hook up. Uh, <laughs> let's move on to the women of Mad Men, uh, Peggy, Joan, and Betty. Uh, well, that could be a full show on itself, um, but I have one question. Uh, which one, uh, not actress, but which character was your favorite to design for? Mm. Probably Betty. Oh, and why is that? You know, I loved, um, I loved Betty so much because I, I felt for her that she was so trapped mm -hmm. in uh, just like trying to climb out to reach happiness, you know? And I always felt like she had such a journey because she was really trapped at home. I right. really felt like she had no choices. But in that, she still had to create like this facade. Mm -hmm. And so I just always loved the idea that she and Dawn both were in a partnership of facades. Mm -hmm. And it was always so inspiring to me. And also, like, um, one time I had had a conversation with Matthew Weiner, and um, he said, oh, you know, she's like a cupcake. You, you peel off all the layers. And I said, oh, I, I was thinking of her as like an onion. Because, mm -hmm. you know, she was so, um, like, bitter and toxic in a way. But really, like, not having um, just sort of, like, the capability of, like, reaching happiness. So mm -hmm. I just always found her character so interesting and multi-layered while being superficial and she was also so beautiful right so i just thought There's a lot there it's yes, very very rich yes, it is um and that was i mean i think that show did so much i mean 
shows resonate throughout our, like uh, the zeitgeist and it inspired people to get interested in mid-century architecture and certainly fashions of the 1950s. Um, when you're designing a pro project and you had, you know, Deadwood, you had your big belt buckle on, did you kind of really get into mid-century fashion when you were doing Mad Men personally? I did sometimes. I, w I would, I would like do combinations of wearing like 1960s jewelry, right? You know, and mixing it up with my jeans or whatever. But um, no, I don't think I was ever walking out in costume or anything. Right, right. But you were definitely <laughs> influenced. I, I get it though, because there sometimes I could just go like you know to France or something, and I only want to wear stripes for two weeks. Yes, you know, I'm very exactly. impressionable. I know, or you know, after eight years, I just thought, oh my gosh, I can't look at this again, you know? Right, right. But, um, I, but I do love that period, and I think it's, it's such a beautiful, uh, beautiful period, and kind of like iconic American yeah. classics, too, yeah. you know? Yeah, I think of, yeah. when I think of the 50s, I think of the clothes, and I think of, you know, like big A line skirts and ladies with white gloves and like, you know, flower hats on. So it was definitely <laughs> a huge thing. Okay, now let's um, get to our current era, I guess, is just um, working with um, the Dutton family, the origin story, 1883. I'm sure there are fans. <laughs> and this was your first project with Taylor Sheridan, who's created all of these amazing shows. It was. Um, how did you guys connect? Um, you know, I was asked to, actually the, the producer of Mad Men was mm -hmm. uh, working on the reshoots of Yellowstone. Okay. Um, the fourth season, and he had suggested that I meet with Taylor, and they had talked to me about um, designing Yellowstone for mm -hmm. the fourth season, but there was like a scheduling thing or whatever, and Taylor said, hey, we're gonna do 1883 first. Would you like to design 1883? Right. You know, you've done Deadwood and um, known for your Westerns, and would you like to join us to design 1883? And I said, of course, I would love it. Right, right. So that's how. And we had a great Amazing. conversation, and, uh, and he said, Janie, whatever you do, don't wash the clothes. Right. And I said, well, I don't do laundry. Perfect. That's what Perfect. I said, I know. No, I, I get it, I get it. And we had a little conversation backstage about that look, which, you know, in the fashion biz, we sometimes call it rusticity, but it just means dirty. Um, and um, there are all kinds of tricks that, you know, because most of that stuff is like new and you're making that yes. uh, to fit the actors. And, you know, you can't go out and find 25, you know, vintage pieces of whatever. So you yeah. make it yeah. and then you age it with little tricks like, what we call cowboy crud. I have, I have a whole, I have a distressing and aging team. Oh. And so my distresser and ager came up with the magic solution of cowboy crud. And what is it? Well, if there's anybody in the audience who wants to help me market this, I bring it on. I can't tell you what it is. Oh, it's a trade secret. Yes, trade it is. Secret. It's a but trade it, secret. It makes everything look old and sweaty. It's, uh, it's like cowboy mud, and it does an amazing job. Oh, it's so, yeah. uh, the authenticity on all, like every um, Taylor Sheridan show is something you notice. And on the period pieces, 1883 and then 1923, the detail, again, is beyond from like Thank the you. dirt and the wear and the abrasion. And I'm like watching with an eagle eye to like look for something new and like a little tag and you killed it. A tag. <laughs> Or sweat, sweat. Yeah, you no. liked you liked the faux the faux sweat. I, yeah, I know it's a lot of sweat at the back of the neck, <laughs> and um, and making a hat look old is so hard. I've run them over with my car. <laughs> like, no, I have, and it's really it's hard to make it look real. So, 1883, the main character uh, Elsa goes on uh, a journey personally, which is reflected in her costumes. Um, how did you reflect her arc with costumes? And I think we have some of the Lukes. Oh, and this is Elsa. Um, so yeah, creating that, that character's journey, I guess, through costumes. Um, yes, that piece was so important. Well, first of all, when I had first started designing that, uh, 1883, I had had a lot of conversations with Taylor about Elsa, her character, and uh, the color blue was very important to him, and mm -hmm. yellow. So. Basically, nobody else in the show could wear blue or yellow. Oh, wow. Just Elsa. 
But you know, part of her like being blue, her her costume being blue was about optimism, hope, hopefulness. Right. The sky. It's like there's an innocence to a blue bonnet. It's very yeah. It's very right? pioneer. It's ethereal. It's mm -hmm. like of of the earth, of the sky. Mm -hmm. So um, I designed her uh, travel dress, and the travel dress really tells the story of Elsa's journey too, because you know by episode four she's cut off her sleeves, she's gotten into pants because she's riding horses with the cowboys. Right. So her whole costume really had to go through all of these different um, iterations mm -hmm. to become something that she basically ends the series with. As a real person would. I mean, it's just, it's evolving and organic. And then um, we have another uh, image of Elsa. Um, she's on that horse. Um, <laughs> she is. Um, oh, do you do, the, do you do the tack and everything else for the horses? I have a question about that. That would be the, the Wranglers. I think I would be really good at that, so put a good uh, word okay. in. I'm very good with that. <laughs> No, I, mean, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do everything. Um, but this, uh, is, this is incredible. This was like a native inspired um, costume. Yes, the, um, the leggings I designed for Elsa are authentically Comanche and it has um, the specific Comanche fringe. Mm -hmm. And also the fringe, like the fringe is very important in Native American culture because uh, the fringe is to basically brush away your footprints like as you walk. Oh, I had no idea. So it's like, it's all purposeful. And we did all of the hand beating in my shop um, and each thing on the vest has a specific meaning like um, in Comanche culture. And one of the things is that we sewed on, which was very prevalent of the time, it's like to sew on elk teeth. Um, and there are elk teeth on the vest and the, right. that is to represent wealth and prosperity. Okay. But um, there's it's like Chanel, but for the plains. <laughs> Pearls. <laughs> Pearls, as yeah. opposed to elk teeth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Whatever works. <laughs> and then um, two of my favorites you got to work with. I'm so jealous. Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. Yeah. Um, and I, kn yeah, I know you told me they were delightful, and I'm not surprised. Um, They're so wonderful. And you spend a lot of time with the actors. I think yes. people also don't realize that um, the actor's job, obviously, you know, memorize the script, show up, be on set, but there's also a lot of preparation in fitting. So you're spending hours and hours a day before you go into production to make sure that they feel good in the costume, that they think it um, tells their story, and that it works. Yes. So what were the fittings like? Were you guys singing? Whoa, well, that is a great question. Actually, I have to tell y'all, Tim McGraw sang Happy Birthday to me. Wow. But he did not sing Happy Birthday. He, sa he sang You Say It's Your Birthday by the Beatles. Oh, wow. I mean, when I first met Tim, my assistant was like, Janie, you got to calm yourself down because I, I, I was so right. I'm such a fan of his, right? And that, yes. And it was really, uh, I was a little starstruck before I met him. And he's super hot. He is, yes, he is. <laughs> And like, he just is. like, even just like in a t-shirt, everything's just popping out and it's just. I know, he's so sweet. He's so and sweet. Very, and a lovely person. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Yes, he is. And he so is. is Faith, so is Faith. Faith is gorgeous and so lovely as well. Yes, and I was telling you she called me Tabasco because why? I'm spicy. So I, I, I love them so much. They're both wonderful people. Me too. <laughs> They're pro Tim, Faith, if you're watching back in Franklin, hello. <laughs> um, we've heard, this is another thing that I'm obsessed with, which is cowboy camp that the actors go to to learn how to ride and yes. they probably have to learn how to tie knots and make coffee on a campfire. I mean, I'm thinking it's a reality show, Paramount <laughs> Plus. <laughs> Who could we, whoever could we get to host it, Janie? <laughs> You and me. Exactly. Um, We'd be so But good. did you go to cowboy camp? Does uh, everybody did, have to go? I didn't. No? I, well, I was just there in the beginning to make sure that, you know, all the actors had boots and hats. Okay. But no, no, I wasn't invited. Oh, we should do that next I would, season. <laughs> let's do it. I want to go to cowboy camp let's too. Let's do it. I'm going to, you know Taylor. I, us up. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. Maybe um, he'll let me he's in. He's going to love me. <laughs>
probably put me on the show with this shirt. <laughs> There's a new cowgirl in town. <laughs> okay, now, um, and the reason, one of the reasons why we're all here, which is 1923, mm. and there's the amazing exhibit. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Um, I don't have a broken neck, but every time I turn that way, I feel like my mic doesn't work, so I do this a lot. Um, <laughs> but you must go see the exhibit if you haven't. You can see the costumes up close and personal. You can actually, well, you're not supposed to touch them, but I did. Um, <laughs> you can touch something that Helen Mirren wore, which I don't know why that's so tantalizing to me, but it was. <laughs> But um, this is such an epic production, and uh, I know we have um, two of the stars of the show here, and I was, I was talking to them on the red carpet about how it looks like a movie. It does. Like, it's shot so beautifully, and the level of detail on all the costumes, but everything, you know, there's like aerial shots of people just riding horses through a valley, which you don't really need, and they're very expensive, but it's so beautiful, it makes it feel like a movie. And it's so epic, it feels like a movie. This show, um, I think, filmed on three continents, um, and you had like thousands of casts and extras. Um, how many people did you dress for this show in total? Oh my gosh, I didn't, I haven't counted, counted it yet. And also, I want to say hello to Julia, who plays Alexandra. Yes, there she is, so gorgeous. And then Jennifer is here too, who played Sister Mary. Oh my God, that's Sister Mary? Uh, yes. I had no idea. She was so mean on the show, but she's so lovely in real life. It's called acting, everybody. <laughs> um, I had no idea. Wow. Yes, and I think Joe is here too, who played uh, uh, Alexandra's friend, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. Yes, maybe Joe's here now too. Is Joe here too? <laughs> you know. New York, it's a hotbed of acting talent. <laughs> I know. I, well, I have so much fun with the actors. I really, uh, I can't tell y'all how much fun we have. And, and you went to all those places. You went I to did. South Africa, I did. Malta. We went to Malta, yes. Tanzania. Julia, Julia and Branton and I and um, people from my team, we went to South Africa for two months. We were in Malta and we were in Montana. And um, What's your favorite? South Africa. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What did you do that was incredible that we need to all do? Oh my gosh. Did you go on a safari. Yes. Yeah. Went on a safari. It was uh, went on a safari there because we stayed at this at this place called Tana, which was the animal reserve. Okay. And we we were shooting very close to there, and so um, it was my birthday the next day, and I was getting ready to leave, and I said okay, I just want to see the elephants because we, right. had, we had gone out a couple of times and so I didn't see the elephants and I love elephants. And I was like, I'm just going to go meditate for like five minutes and I'm going to envision the elephant coming. Right. And so I got into the Jeep with the two guides and we're five minutes out. And I told the guides, I said, okay, I've meditated. I've asked to see the elephant to come mm -hmm. see us. I know y'all laugh, right? I was like... They, they laughed at me too. And five minutes we were on the trek and not one, but like 20. Wow. 25, three herds of elephants like came ah. to see me for my birthday. Oh my God. <laughs> You're like Drew Barrymore in Firestarter. <laughs> I love that. And, and that was, was your favorite part of the whole trip, besides working I mean, with the amazing I cast. I mean, we had so much fun. We had so much fun together. I we love really that. did. And uh, you know, the the to work with the South African crew is incredible. I mean, I I love the people there so much. Did you have to ship all of the costuming we there? Did. Wow. We did. Okay. We shipped all the costumes there. I I actually had some of my crew go to Italy and go to Spain to mm -hmm. pull a lot of the costumes from the costume houses there because. Right. You know, 1920s is, you know, 100 years old. There's not a lot of stock. Right. And we had thousands of extras, like in each continent, you know, thousands of extras. Right. Montana, thousands of extras. Wow. So we were sourcing from all over huh. the globe, really. I was wondering, because, yeah, even just like so many like little glasses and leather goods. I mean, it's all the details are all there. Let's talk about... Um, Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. Let's. I mean, I don't really have a question. Just tell me everything. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're like two of the most legendary, like they're right up there. I know. 
Oh, they are. Well, um, they were both amazing to work with. Harrison is a hoot. He is so dry and so funny. And he is, uh, you know, very particular, which uh -huh. is awesome. I totally appreciate that. Particular and, with like what he's wearing? Yes, yes, yes. Like he really, which I love about him, he loves everything to feel real. Mm -hmm. You know, so it had to be like broken down just perfectly. Right. Um, it had to fit perfectly. He really, um, I love how he just like encompasses the character. What about so the fun. underwear? Like, um, does it have to be? No, I'm just thinking if they're that method, like if I were getting ready for a show and I was like putting my like, you know, deer skin later hosen on I had my Tom Ford microfiber briefs on, it would feel weird. So do you even do like the underwear? He, yes, of I'll course, bet. I do. He was wearing long johns, don't worry, he was. Okay. Yes. And, uh, and Helen wore her proper foundations too. Okay, amazing. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that, you know, Helen and I talked a lot about, which I love, we totally uh, saw eye to eye on this because, um, you know, she is a character who's been on the farm for a long time. She's not a, a character who's like in 1920s fashion. Right. So um, her costumes are really, I designed them really based on an earlier period, like mm -hmm. early 1900s, 19 teens. Right. Because she wouldn't be like at. She wasn't up to date. She wasn't up to date. So, uh, you know, we did like an earlier silhouette for her, which, okay. you know, yeah, that makes is sense. like perfect sense and great for the character. Absolutely. So. Um, and um, I heard it was quite the process to find the perfect hat for Harrison. Was that one of those it detail was. moments where he was a tough customer in the best possible way? Uh, no, I would say that's more Taylor. Oh, really? Yes, Taylor Sheridan, he's so specific about what he wants his lead man to wear and the mm -hmm. hat. Mm -hmm. And so um, I designed a hat for him that was uh, which I called the Montana Peak. It has a Montana Peak crease. Okay. So like the crease gets shorter in the front. Right, and the now, pinch. Exactly, and now I call it the Jacob. And do people make the hats for you in LA, like in your shop, or you go to like a milliner? Well, actually, because we were in Butte, Montana, mm -hmm. and there's, I think, basically a Joann's in town. Oh, okay. That's it. So, you know, it's very limited in the resources, right? right? So, um, my co-costume designer, Gabby Acosta, uh, and part of my team in Montana found mm -hmm. this man named Bear. And Bear is a hat maker. Oh, wow. So, Bear had, like, a little camper. He would pull up to my studio. I think in the, I know this guy. Do you? <laughs> he would pull his camper up to the abandoned mall where we were, yes, you know, we him. had our shop, yes. yes. As soon as you said abandoned mall, right. I was like, I, it's, coming, it's coming back to me. Favorite place where Joann's is, last yes, store in the yes, mall. Yes, And uh, th I'm thankful for Joann's, let me tell you. God bless him. And so <laughs> Bear would sit at his stool and make hats all day long for us. And he ended up making all of Harrison's hats, wow. all of his multiples. And they're made out of like beaver fur, right? They are, Compressed, yes. like into yes. felt. Felt, exactly. See, I know what I'm talking you about. You do, <laughs> you do. Bear had a big impression on me. Oh my God, Bear is the cutest thing on the planet. We love him. And is Bear coming back for another season? Bear is. Amazing, I'm gonna have to find Bear. I'm going you to Yellowstone in a couple weeks. Oh, yeah. um, I'm gonna have to give me Bear's number. I, I I will, I will. He doesn't have. He always had a burner phone. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Bear was so jealous. Um, I want to talk about Helen's blue dress. That was unbelievable. Thank um, you. And was she similar to Harrison, where she was also very invested, or did she just kind of let you do your thing? And oh, she totally let me do my thing. And but the, the thing that was incredible about this blue dress. And oh, like, and that's here. That's upstairs. It is. It's here, and it's it's an incredible piece. It's one of my favorites of the show because I really wanted to have the tie-in with Elsa's character and Kara Dutton because. Um, you know, they really are the hope and the optimism of the show. And so it was important that they both wore kind of like the same color mm -hmm. in the, like the beginning episodes. Cohesive yes. throughout all of the um, three shows. I like to do that. Um, yeah, it's good stuff. Good. <laughs> um, 
Now, um, we're going to um, talk about one of the other characters. We have um, a clip, um, a character with several iconic looks in 1923 is Alexandra, who's introduced in 1920s glam. And she adopts a more traditional safari look, which all of the safari stuff is like Ralph Lauren dream. Thank um, you. And then she ends in this stunning white beaded gown. So I think we have a clip. Alexandra. Stop the car. Got room for another? No, not really. My knight in shining armor. Alexandra! Please drive. Look at me. If you don't want me to come, I'll get out. Where I'm going is dangerous. Let's look death in the eye then, shall we? I mean, it's like a, it's like a movie. It's epic, <laughs> um, and just it's so rich and so beautiful. Everything, the acting, of course, the costumes, the music, all of it was just you just want to like be in that world. It's just a romantic dream. Um, it is. Yeah. Um, what was it like um, to design in such an iconic fashion decade? You know, I think the 20s seemed so glamorous, and it was you know the Roaring 20s. People were like living large. Well, the, I mean, 1923 is really pre-flapper, pre... Okay. I mean, there was definitely prohibition for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a time of rebellion and also... Uh, it, I mean, I think of it as like an arts and crafts kind of uh -huh. period, too. It's very artsy. It's more eccentric. It's not... Uh, especially like the women's clothing, it's not uh, based so much on the feminine form. It's right. much more of it like, like a Frank straight, Lloyd Wright. A, it's like much more of like a boy silhouette, a yeah. straight silhouette. It's, mm -hmm. you know, women were cutting off their hair. It, so there was a lot of like rebellion things going on during that, that period. Um, but, you know, just to create the whole, like the safari world was incredible right. because it was such a, it's such a beautiful, dreamy period. And one of the things that I loved about um, Alexandra and just her whole rebellion is that if you notice the whole color scheme is like very pale, very light mm -hmm. and but you know Julia, I told Julia I'm like you have to wear the Hermes scarf because it's like navy and orange and right. it has like this rebellious spirit to it so yeah. that's why she's it's wearing like a firecracker. She, yeah, she is a firecracker in real life too. Yeah. Yes. And not English. <laughs> Acting, everybody. Acting. She's so good. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and then there's Tiana, and her story in 1923 is heartbreaking, but it's so important to tell. Um, would you please describe the process of designing the series indigenous characters and those religious heads at the boarding school? Um, did you, uh, did you consult uh, cultural experts? Was it more you know, research in libraries? How do you um, do that accurately and with sensitivity? And, and it's done so well here. Um, well, you know, one of the most amazing things that I have done is to be able to be a part of 1883 and 1923. And we have a lot of Native American consultants mm -hmm. and um, Mo Brings Plenty is like our head Native American consultant. And he went to one of the boarding schools. And wow. um, a, a lot of the Native American children that were kids, the actors too, that were in the show, like their parents, their grandparents went to the, the schools, to the government schools. Mm -hmm. And so they really shared like so many stories with us that are 
incredibly heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, you know, hard to believe that, you know, these schools closed, you know, only like 20, 30 years ago. Wow, incredible. And they were, you know, forced to go there. So um, Mo Brings Plenty, like, consulted a lot and shared a lot of his stories, a lot of his family stories. And, you know, we researched a lot as well. Um, so we, um, I, I found a photo of one of the Native American schools that was an inspiration to design the costumes for um, Tiona's school. Mm -hmm. And um, and we you know we made all of the uniforms and for oh, the wow. girls and yeah. the boys and um, it was uh, a, yeah an incredible journey. Such an important part of the show. So it thank really you. is. It really uh, is. Well, we could talk for hours. Um, there's so <laughs> many. I mean, I could talk an hour on like each of the different series. But um, uh, before I ask my last question, we're going to share one of the final scenes from season one of 1923. You have to take me back. That's my wife. You have no right! You have no right! Where'd you have my gun? I love you, Alex! Why did you do this to me? <laughs> Why? Why? No! <laughs> Bozeman. She could have made it much easier if she said New Jersey. <laughs> right? But I'm glad she said Bozeman because it made for a great show. Um, and Taylor really knows how to leave us wanting more. Again, the drama and the romance and the cliffhanger. I know. Um, so season two is coming, right? I so, think I so. Okay. Yes. I, 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 I don't know. Um, well, um, we're, we're all down for it. Thank you so much to Janie. Thank, Thank you, you to our audience. Um, I want to thank the Paley Center uh, for media for hosting us today um, and the audience. And please, you must go upstairs and check out the exhibit if you haven't. And you must watch season one of 1923. It's available now on, I believe it's on Paramount Plus. I think it is. Yeah. It you, is. If you like that program, you, on May 12th, <laughs> you can watch RuPaul's Drag Race All Stars also <laughs> on Paramount Plus. And um, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, what Carson. Thank you.